Right, so this, this letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians um, explains a number of things. It explains our, the wonderful gift of salvation as it happens. It explains the mystery of the church body built on the unity of the spirit and it's like the perfect family loving relationships in the world. You know, it, it, Paul explains our position as believers with his favourite expression, in Christ. And that's our position. We are in Christ when we become believers. Because um, we're part of God's family now. And that is the wonderful thing, the way Paul explains it. In Christ is used so many times in this letter. Um, and the other thing is, like, Paul had this obligation to the churches that he'd founded um, to teach them really how to survive in the corrupt age that they were in. It's no different for us today. We're in this corrupt age and we need, each of us need to know how we're going to survive in this time. I mean, the last couple of times in the discipleship course we've been going over to, um, trials and temptations, but uh, this isn't the same as uh, what I'm saying this morning. You know, you know, the Christian life, it's not a walk in the park. It's not bed of roses, is it? It can be really quite hard at times. It's a real spiritual battle. But what a blessing we get when we become believers. What a blessing it is to know Jesus personally. Isn't it? What a blessing. That should encourage each one of us. So what I'd like you to do today, I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 6. Right, the last chapter. Okay. Right, I'm going to read from verse 10. Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the full armour of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, Pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petitions for all the saints. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your scriptures. We thank you for your word, and we ask now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would open it up to each one of us and give us some fresh knowledge of this, Father, and a fresh understanding of what you have for us. And we just give you thanks, Lord, that it is you that supply everything we need in this Christian life. So, Father, we just ask now that uh, you bless the reading of the whole scriptures. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Be strong in the Lord. That's the first thing it says, isn't it? Be strong in the Lord. It's nothing to do with our strength. We stand only... In God's strength, the strength of the Lord, don't we? You know, it's his might. It's his strength. It says that. It says, in the strength of the Lord and in the strength of his might. Nothing to do with us. When we stand as Christians against the enemy, we stand in his might. You know, the wonderful scripture, you know, you understand that Paul said, when I am weak, he is strong. And he said, in that's the situation, I'd rather be weak all the time. It doesn't matter whether I'm ill or whatever happens. But if the Lord is strong in me, then we can reach out to the lost. That was what Paul, the Apostle Paul said. How much more does it apply to each one of us? 
that we need to be strong in the faith. We need to be strong in God's might here. You know, you know, at this time when Paul wrote this letter, he was in house arrest in Rome. That meant he had freedom in his, the one house that he was living in, but he had Roman soldiers standing in there guarding him. He couldn't go out, he couldn't do anything. Yes, he was able to have people come and visit him, but he was stood there, he was in that house with Roman soldiers guarding him every day. I wonder if that's why a lot of the things he thought about here were aimed at Roman soldiers. Okay. It's a possibility, isn't it? You know, they all had their uniform, whether they had their armour on, I don't know, but they would have all been in uniform, ready. They would have all had a sword with them, I expect, as well. But that's when he wrote this letter, and that to the Ephesians. And he said, in verse 11, put on the full armour of God, that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Put on the full armour of God, every single bit of it, and that includes us, that's what we need to do. Not just a bit of it, we need all the total armour of God when we approach the enemy, when we are out there in the world, because the world is full of problems as we all know. You know, the other thing about this armour, just generally, is that it's all defensive, there's only one bit that is offensive, everything's defensive to protect us. Wonderful, isn't it? That's God's protection for each one of us. Okay? Well, why? Why is all this happening? You know, if we're in a spiritual battle, we mustn't be frightened. We mustn't be <coughs> away. We mustn't run away. We should be like the soldiers. They stand firm. You know? You know? Um, it says... That's the one thing it says in these verses we've read. It says, stand firm. Don't give any ground. Stand firm. And that's what we need to do in our faith, is stand firm for the Lord. Okay? Um, it's like, really, it's like the soldiers. They had to stand. They shouldn't run. They should stand where they are. They should, the territory they've gained, they should hold and keep. That was, that's basically what this is about. You know, the other thing for us to remember is we do not fight for victory. Christ has already got the victory. That's the beauty of it. What we do is we fight from victory. From victory. You know, we're told to stand our ground. This is what he says so many times in this letter. He says, stand, firm, resist. And the Bible tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Yeah? Every circumstance, that's what we're told. You know, um, we need to understand, it says here, didn't we, the schemes of the devil. We need to understand them. Now, in a normal army, in a normal army, the intelligence corps, you know, the army plays a vital role, doesn't it? You know, finds out what the problems are and what the enemy's doing so that it gives the soldiers the right idea of what they need to do. You know? Very important role. Well, Dan will understand what I'm saying about the army as well, only today. But, you know, can we all understand the schemes of the devil? Do we understand fully all of his schemes? You know? Do we know what to expect when we go out into the world to witness for the Lord? Do we know what to expect, what's coming on us? usually gives us a surprise, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> as if it's a do it. You know, it's the fear of the unknown. Well, many of us find excuses not to witness for the Lord. Is it this fear of the unknown? I certainly know about that, because it certainly came on me a number of times in my past. Yeah. Look at the schemes. Let's just look at the schemes of the, of the devil. Well, look at his name to start with. Devil, that he means the accuser. So he's the one that accuses the brethren before God. We've only got to look at the book of Job and you see that how, how Satan accused, uh, accused when well, he was accusing God, that he was protecting Job too much, wasn't he? So he's accuser of the brethren. And then you've got the Satan. Well, that, that word means the adversary. 
And he is. He's the one adversary we've got. Um, but he's also called so many other things in the word. He's called the arch deceiver. You know, he was the one that deceived Eve in the garden right at the beginning. And he's been doing that all the way through. He deceives people, makes you, <laughs> makes you think he's right, but he's a deceiver. It's also a tempter. Tempts us to do all the things we shouldn't do. Tempts us that the old self in us will raise up and do things we shouldn't. That's what the enemy's doing. He's tempting us all the time. <coughs> Says he's a murderer. Said he was a murderer from the beginning. It came to murder Abel. That was the first murder. And he was there from the beginning right the way through. He's a liar. It's called the father of lies, isn't it? All these aspects we need to keep in our head. But not only that, he's called the angel of light. When you think of Satan, when he was created, when God created him, he was the number one angel. He was the most beautiful angel and the most powerful angel. And of course, what happened? Pride gets God into him. And it's pride that we face a lot of times in our life. There's a lot of problems in our life. And it was pride that got into Satan's heart and he wanted to be as God. He wanted to take over from God. That's basically him. But he is an angel of light. He will approach you as if, um, well, did God really say that to you? Are you sure? You know, oh, you'd, you'd be alright to do that. That wouldn't upset anyone. Just go ahead and... That's the sort of thing. He appears an angel of light, but just with a little deception, a little twist. In what he does. But he's the God of this age, as we know. He's got influence over all of society influences at the moment. One thing we've got to remember, though, that um, he is a created being, and he can only be in one place at another at a time. But he's got a horde of support people, if you like. Because when he fell, he took a third of the angels that God had created with him. And they, of course, are all the demons we see in the world at this moment. All the demonic activity is done by the demons. All spirit beings, as we know. All created. But, you know, they all influence our society and each one of us. Yeah? This is what we've got to be so, so careful of. Um, and his battle... Be honest, his battle plans are formidable and they divide and they conquer people and they divide fellowships. We've seen that happening, we've seen it in our own fellowship, we've seen it in many churches. The enemy can get in and divide it very easily. You know, most important thing is we stick on the word because what that says is truth, beginning and end, literally. But what we must never, ever forget is that he is a defeated foe. That's the key. He is a defeated foe and we can resist him and he will flee from us. Okay. Well, that's about the enemy. Now let's look about what we can do. What we can do. It's, um, you know, it says in verse 12, For we struggle, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, well, to be honest, sometimes it really does seem that we are struggling against human beings all the time, but it's not. It's not. It's against the rulers, against the powers, and against the world forces which Satan controls. Of this darkness, it says, and it is. It's pretty dark, getting darker out there. Against, every, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Okay. <coughs> So we're not fighting flesh and blood. We've got to remember this when we go out, when, when we actually talk to people about the Lord especially, that we're, we're, what's against us is the spiritual forces from the heavenlies, from, from, from all these demonic controllers. Okay? And it says, again, okay, stand firm. That's what we've got to do. It's, to be honest, and I've seen this in previous churches, we can take this for the Lord and we can go and march around this town and we'll do this and we'll do that. Sorry. 
If you try that, I'm not going to get anywhere. It says, in the word here, it says we should stand firm. Stand firm in our faith. Stand firm. It doesn't say we should go chasing after the enemy. Why is all the armour, most other than one bit, is all protection for us? Gives us protection against the wiles of the enemy there. Verse 13, it says, Therefore, take up the full armour of God, that you may be able to resist the e in the evil day. And having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm. Now it says, God has provided all this wonderful equipment for us. It's not our armour, it's his armour that he supplied us. Look, take up the full armour of God. It's God's armour, and we have to appropriate it and put every bit of it on. It would be good if we never took any of it off, quite honestly. But we need to appropriate it like that. As I said, we're not told to go chasing after Satan and his hordes, attacking them. We're told to resist. To stand firm, stand in defence of the gospel, stand in defence of the Lord, hold our territory. You know, this is what we've got to do. And there's so much against us these days, to be honest, that we need to stand firm. There's so much in the world going on totally against God's word, and we've got to stand firm against it. Stand against it. Okay? Basically, because Satan is, try, Satan is trying to rob believers of all the spiritual blessings that God's given us. That's what we've got to be aware of. He's trying to rob us of everything. We've got to stand firm in our belief, stand firm in our faith. That is so important. As I said, most of the items are defensive, actually. Could you put the first picture up? You get a better idea of this, actually. Um, that's it, look. There we go. Look, this will give you an idea when we go through the pieces of, of armour. Um, verse 14, it says, Stand firm, again, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Having girded your loins with truth. Well, we have a belt of truth. All, there we go. That's a belt of truth. The, the Roman soldier's belt used to hold up all their undergarments and often it had the sword, although on that picture he's got the sword slung around his neck. Most of them were in their belt. And that belt guard yeah, was the guard. Okay? That, that was the belt, the belt of truth. Okay? It gave them freedom of movement because they girded up all the thing and they got this freedom of movement. Okay? And, you know, for us, truth signifies a believer's integrity and faithfulness. That's what truth signifies for us, okay? Um, you know, we mustn't tell, well, one of the things, we mustn't tell any lies, because if we do, things start falling apart for us, and that is certainty. Oh, that's only a little white lie. Sorry, if you mention anything, it's not true. Things will start falling apart, promise, you know? So the belt of truth is so important. It gives us integrity. And, as I say, it shows our faithfulness to the Lord as well. But it shows our character. Our character. So we must maintain the truth, the belt of truth. And it goes on to the second part of that, verse of 14 says, as well as saying, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate was the biggest part of the armour. It covered from your neck to your loins. Right? It protected um, literally all your vital, well, your heart and your lungs, the, the main vital organs, really. Uh, and it's the biggest piece, biggest, well, no, actually, it was one of the biggest pieces of, of armour didn't have to be a solid thing like you see in some of the um, some of the knights jousting in this country many years ago but well, that was all solid armor but these often that had metal plates inserted in there in <coughs> that probably when you can see it sort of slatted they often had their garment the leather garment with metal in, in them to give them more movement you know chain mail is another thing that, that, that was used I'm not sure whether the Romans used that there anyway so You know, what does it symbolise? The breastplate of righteousness. Well, to be honest, we haven't really got any righteousness of ourselves at all. But 
it symbolises our sanctifying righteousness in Christ that's practised by us, if you like. Um, it's Christ's righteousness in us so that we practise it by living a godly life. The more godly life we live, the more, you know, this is what, I mean, the Father sees us through Jesus' righteousness. That was all done for us. It says in, in I'm going to read 2 Corinthians, just one verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it says, in verse 21, it says this, it says, He, that's God the Father, made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the result of our salvation. So the righteousness of God in him. We become that. That's what the breastplate of righteousness. And we go on, verse 15 says, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, soldier shoes and sandals, which most of them used to wear. Funny enough, the sandals, they used to have hobnails in them to give them the grip, because that was important for your feet. You know, very important when you're looking at an army, you have a good grip in feet, you know, the shoes you've got on. And for a believer, we gain stability or sure-footedness from the gospel. Yeah? That wonderful gospel of peace that it's mentioned. That's where we get it from. It gives us the it gives us really as well that perfect peace that we can stand in firm in any battle that we're in. Okay? It gives life. The gospel gives life. That's what we always have to remember. The gospel gives life to others. And that is the importance of those scriptures. You know, it also implies really feet, movement, going out. It implies sharing a gospel with a lost world. It's not going to happen if we all sit in a church here and learn lots and lots and do nothing with it. We've got to go out and we've got to do something, otherwise the lost are going to remain lost. You now the other thing is the most victorious Christian is a witnessing Christian. Now it's not I said that, I read that, one of my commentaries, which is good. And the most victorious Christian is a witnessing Christian, and that is, and that is true. I think we could say that pretty much, you know. It's such a wonderful thing when you talk to people and they do listen to us and we get a positive response, you know. As Leslie, Lily and John will all sort of, uh, you know, Pat will understand and Dorothy will understand that, what we're saying, you know. So we must shed, sh shod our feet with the, with the gospel of peace and, and share it. The next in verse 16, it says, In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the missiles of the evil one, or flaming arrows, or darts, whatever it's got in your verse. And that, the, the Roman shield, you can see it, was two and a half feet wide and four foot long, made of wood, so it would have been really heavy, but it was clad on the outside either with linen or leather, and in fact leather doesn't burn as quick as wood, so it used to sort of, you know, because the enemy in those days used to dip their arrows in pitch and light them and shoot them at them, you know? So you'd have all these flaming arrows. That's, that's where this, this comes from. So we've got Satan's attack is like the flaming missiles, the flaming arrows. That they, and the shield of faith. Faith protects us from that. The other interesting thing when you look at the Romans, the way they used to react, is these big shields they could interlock. We'll put the next one. They could lock them together. You see that? They could move as one body, not just individual people. And that was important. The, the, the weapons, well, one of the weapons was the sword, which we've seen. And the way they used to do it, the Romans could all move together, lock the shields, and then they would be like one wall, if you like, against the enemy. And when the enemy ran to attack, all they need to do is turn and stab. That's what they used to do, just slightly turn so that they would give a gap and shove their sword in and pierce the other person's body. That's what, that's what it's like. That's what they were doing. Now, okay, what is this interlocking of shields, this shield of faith, the interlocking of faith? What does that give show to us? 
I think it's so important that it means that we're not in a battle alone. We're not each and every one in alone. But we can all come together and do the battle at the same time. We can all interlock our faith and, and do it together. That's what I think it this interlocking. You know? Um, you know, and faith we're talking about here, it's not the saving faith, it's not saving faith, it's rather the living faith that we have. It's, um, it is the defensive weapon that protects the entire body. When you think of the size of those shields, it protects the whole body. Okay? You know, the stronger your faith becomes, the longer you read, the more you read, the stronger a Christian becomes, the stronger your faith becomes, the less chance the enemy is going to pick you off. That's important. I'm going to put the next one up so we can read that. Thanks. Um, okay. The more we learn the biblical doctrines, the correct biblical doctrines, our knowledge increases in the word and our faith gets stronger. We come closer to the Lord and that is the faith that we're talking about. That wonderful strength of faith that we can have. It goes on the next verse. It says, and take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Well, the helmet protects, obviously protects the head from many glancing blows that obviously in a, in a battle that they went through um, but the helmet of salvation for us salvation protects our minds as well protects our minds from corruption in fact the way we get corruption is quite logical most of the time it comes through the eyes and through the ears and you think the helmet protects most of the head it protects the ears but you had to see in their day, obviously it was a little see, now you've got visors that come down. But in there, do you see what I mean? So, so what comes into our mind then goes into our heart and then comes out through our mouth. And these are the things that happen quite a lot. So we've got this wonderful helmet of salvation that we should wear. Um, you know, the stronger we become, the less Satan is, is going to be able to influence us in any single way, I think. You know, I said the security of our, our eternal salvation will grow stronger as we study the Bible and the closer we get to the Lord. And that is, that is it. That is the truth of the salvation, that wonderful salvation that we have. It protects our minds, number one. Yeah. It goes on, that verse says, as well as the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Well, this is it. The sword is the only offensive weapon that we have. Yeah. We've explained the Roman, short Roman swords that they had, why they used it. The um, thing is, when you look at those swords and what they did, you see, in... in um, the material the sword is made of, okay, when it pierces the foot, you know, in the middle of a battle, gradually that sword becomes blunt, becomes battered and blunt. It's metal, it's logical. Hit another metal, it would come blunt. And uh, won't be much use, it won't be as good as it was in the beginning. But I'll be honest, when you look at this, for us, the sword of the spirit is just the opposite to that. Just the opposite. Because the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's our Bible. It's everything we need for faith. And the more we read it, the more we understand it, okay, it gets stronger. So instead of the physical sword getting blunter as it goes on, the Word of God, as we apply it, becomes stronger the more we do it. The more we do it. It's living and powerful, isn't it? You know? As it says, it targets it targets and pierces the heart and it gets sharper the more we use it. I'm just going to read you one verse from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, and this is what it says there. For the word of God 
is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as division of soul and spirit and both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What a wonderful, isn't it? When you think of that as a wonderful scripture, a wonderful promise, that's what the word of God does. It's that powerful to change people's lives. And that is what we need to wield all the time. You know, the thing is, when we trust God, we trust Christ for our salvation, we get all of that armour for us to use if we apply it and use it. We can't fight the battle, the spiritual battle in our own strength. We can't do that. No matter how strong we think we are, we will not, we will fail if we're doing it in our own strength. Verse 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times. Pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert. With all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Pray at all times. Verse 18. Prayer is the energy. Prayer is the energy that enables us to wear this armour properly. And be able to wield the sword properly. Prayer is the energy behind it all. You know, it says, pray, 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 keep on praying. That is so important. It's the, it's, you know, if we, if we keep praying in the Spirit, praying, it's praying in the power and sphere of the Spirit. And it says, with all perseverance, it's... Uh, you know, it suggests a thoroughness and an intensity in prayer. Not just a quick prayer here and there. It's just that thoroughness in prayer, that intensity of praying. This is what we need to do as Christians. It says stick to it. Do not quit. Stick to it. When times get hard, pray more rather than think, oh, I could do something else. You know, it's important. You know, prayer is powerful and it can change the outcome of many, many situations. We know that, nearly all of us would say that. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of what we've been talking about is witnessing here today. And it'd be great if we could see more of you out there with us on a Saturday, because we do need more people. You know, we're always in the shopping centre in order shop between 10.45 and 1.45 every Saturday. And what does the word say? We're foot soldiers. We're foot soldiers. This is what we've been reading here. We need foot soldiers. And okay, we know not everyone physically can stand up and do that. So we need prayer warriors when we're out there. But, you know, prayer warriors are for the people that physically can't manage it. Yeah? We need that every Saturday. From those times, we need prayer. The importance of prayer, as we know. You know, we can all do something. We can all do something for the Lord to reach the lost, which is so, so important. You know, the church is an army. We're an army. Yeah? You know, soldiers need to stand together. You saw that picture of the way they interlock the shields of shields of faith, we need to interlock our faith together as a whole church and move out as one in the battle. That will get us somewhere. You know, it says that it a lot. You know, together we stand, divided we fall. That's the same with our Christianity. We need to stand together, solid in our faith. You know, that's the importance of meeting together every week. Some people think, well, I'm a Christian, we don't have to meet together. Well, sorry, you're going to lose out. Meeting together and encouraging one another in our faith so that we can stand and we can get through the week and we can deal with all the problems we're likely to face. That's what it's all about. Together we stand, divided we'd fall. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us so much in your word, Father. And as your word says, we're supposed to preach every 
part of your word, not just focus on certain bits that we like. And Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you give us instruction of how we should live our Christian lives, Heavenly Father, which is so important for us to apply, not just for us to read and to become intellectual at this, Father, it's to apply what we, what we read. And Lord, that is so important. So I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd help each and every one of us, Lord. Give us more boldness to speak out to the lost in this world, Father. We meet them day to day as we go through our daily lives. But Lord, I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd help each and every one of us to feel we can get stronger and stronger in you. The more we learn of you, the more we learn of what you have for us and the promises you have for us, those wonderful promises that you give us in your word, Heavenly Father. We do thank you for those. And Lord, the best one of all is that we know that when we come, when we come to the end of this life, when we die or when we're raptured, we will be with you for all eternity. Something that is too big for us to totally grasp. What a wonderful future we have, Father. I just pray that you'd help each of us help to spread that to the people that don't know you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> <coughs>